got that we're in trouble look. There's a look? Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 bad movies which got good TV show adaptations. We can use this. The mayor who destroyed Godzilla. I don't think we should exploit this, it could backfire. For this list, we'll be looking at the cinematic duds with mixed to negative reviews that got a second chance on the small screen. However, we're only including shows that are direct adaptations of movies and not reimaginings of a shared source material. Maybe we shouldn't be doing this. What other bad movies deserve a TV show? Let us know in the comments below. Hey Mojoholics! For a chance to win cash prizes, play our live daily trivia challenges every day at 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern only at watchmojo.com slash play. Number 10, Stargate. Despite being a modest financial success, mixed reviews ensured this proposed trilogy tapped out after just one film. It doesn't work that way. You see, if you don't turn it on from here, we're screwed. Okay, so I'm telling you guys, we're not going anywhere. Instead, Stargate warped to television screens, and the franchise hasn't been the same since. Stargate SG-1 built upon events from the film, but unlike its source material, it gathered equal parts critical and commercial success. You know, you really will like me when you get to know me. Oh, I adore you already, Captain. You don't just have to take our word for it either. The numbers speak for themselves. SG-1 ran for a whopping 10 seasons, spawned four different spin-offs, and even got its own feature-length films. Stargate may have come first, but it's safe to say the franchise owes its reputation to SG-1. That whole Ori thing was not our fault. Just take the blame, you get used to it. Number 9. Barnyard A forgettable and poorly received animated film doesn't exactly scream franchise material. Will you stop doing that? But Barnyard proved all of its naysayers wrong when the farm migrated to the small screen in 2007. Even though it substituted most of its all-star voice cast in the move, the aptly named Back at the Barnyard was a marked improvement over its first outing. Well, oh man, I'm gonna turn in. What? But I got another three movies. The benefit of a long-running series allowed the ensemble cast to shine without being tied down by an overly complex narrative. If anything, the fact that Back at the Barnyard aired for four years just proves that this concept was better suited for television in the first place. Whee! <gasps> A flying pig! I am dreaming! He's buying it! Awesome! <laughs> Number 8. Alien Nation the original Alien Nation film is the kind of weird genre mashup that could only have been made in the 80s. And still it fits. Even then, its reception was still just so so. But there was enough potential in its sci fi premise to warrant an attempted TV show. Against all odds, it was actually pretty good too. The series doubled down on the social implications of aliens arriving on Earth, and that sharper focus earned its spot as one of Fox's most successful scripted series. I thought you didn't take human patients. I really must ask you to leave. Unfortunately, the network's financing issues meant one season was all Alien Nation ever got. But clearly, that's all it needed to turn this forgettable flop into a bona fide cult classic. Tonight, we are having people I work with over for dinner. The idea is for them to see how alike we are to humans. Number 7. The Beastmaster 1999 marked a lot of firsts for Dar's adventures. I have my cunning, and now I have strength. After two laughably bad attempts on the big screen and an even worse TV movie, the titular Beastmaster finally tried out a weekly series. And with that experiment also came another first for the franchise. Good reception. Now, full disclosure, the television series wasn't exactly winning any awards, but considering that none of the films performed well at the box office, the show did a lot to rehabilitate the brand's image. If what you say is true, you should hurry. At the very least, it proved that Beastmaster still had an audience. After all, given what it had to work with, three full seasons is nothing to be ashamed of. He means there's no harm. Well, neither does a snake hidden in the grass until you step on it. Number 6. Wolf Creek What the bloody hell are you mob doing out here? It's not quite right to call this 2000s slasher flick a bad movie. More so, it was just a bit too gratuitous for its time. The same can be said for its 2014 sequel. 
but all that just made Wolf Creek a prime candidate for an all-killer, no-filler horror series. The added screen time let the story reach gorier heights than ever before, and both audience and critics were on board for it. I can see what you're doing here. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Saving the day. A bush knight shining armor. Plus, it's set up as a semi-anthology, meant they didn't have to hold back on the body count either. Add in John Jarrett reprising his role as franchise's villain, and it's no wonder this show is a bloody good time. Welcome to Mix World. <laughs> Number 5. Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea Well, Lee, it's been a long, tough haul from conception to execution. <laughs> but my boy, we've done it. When it came to critical reviews, this disaster film lived up to its genre's name in all the wrong ways. However, audiences were much more forgiving of the concept, and that paved the way for more expeditions on the small screen. It paid off, and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea did not fly under the radar on ABC. Man, that'll make writing a hot tube seem like kid stuff. Instead, it stayed afloat for four whole seasons and over 100 episodes, becoming one of the long-running science fiction programs of its time. Even though the series reused sets and plot lines from the film, the weekly release schedule turned the disparate elements into one of the most beloved shows of the 60s. But uh, your encouragement and my stubbornness working together stopped him just long enough. Doesn't sound like a bad combination. Number four, Godzilla. Turns out the King of the Monsters' biggest weakness isn't tanks, soldiers, or nuclear weapons, it's critic reviews. What, 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 what do we do? Running would be a good idea. Let's go, man! In the case of 1998's Godzilla, the toxic reception effectively killed any shot of a proper big budget sequel. Instead, the franchise got a Saturday morning cartoon. While that sounds like a poor consolation prize, it ended up being exactly what Godzilla needed. He won't hurt you, I think. The TV show took the film's lore, abandoned the overly loud action, and successfully delivered faithful interpretations of the characters. The difference in quality is plain to see. Nowadays, fans agree that the only thing the Godzilla movie did right was pave the way for this much improved animated series. Thanks for keeping Godzilla out of the spotlight. It saved our lives. I guess I owed it that much. And all it cost me was an Emmy! Not that I'm bitter. Number 3. Legion the question here isn't how the show turned out so well, it's why anyone thought Legion needed a show at all. I'm being punished for something, I know it. The plodding action have failed to impress anyone back in 2010, and that's putting it nicely. So, when Dominion promised to continue the story on TV, there was some justified skepticism. But contrary to everyone's expectations, the small screen adaptation was an incredibly solid sci-fi romp. This isn't a city of merchants. It's a city of monsters. Admittedly, it had a very, very low bar to meet, but Dominion still deserves credit for making Legion's world interesting, and it probably helps that it's set 25 years after the events of the movie. What, what is the number one killer of men? Oh yes, heart disease. After angels, of course. Number two, Star Wars The Clone Wars. It's not every day that one of the worst films of the year also spawns one of the generation's best animated programs. Then again, The Clone Wars has a knack for defying expectations. So, this is where the fun begins. After the theatrically released pilot film got dragged through the mud, the television series immediately brought back audience goodwill. And then some. It tackled morally grey characters and sophisticated ideas without ever abandoning the classic charm that makes Star Wars, Star Wars. Plus, it gave us Ahsoka Tano. What more do you need? You have Kenobi's arrogance. You'll find I have many qualities for you to dislike. Let's just say that if they released another The Clone Wars movie today, it would be a very different story. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Buffy the Vampire Slayer Ironically, the only thing Buffy slayed in her on-screen debut was a chance at a sequel. You gotta see plus. I can't believe I cheated off of you. 
See, long before Sarah Michelle Gellar picked up the stake, Christy Swanson took a crack at the character with decidedly mixed results. Suffice it to say, the misguided film didn't inspire much confidence in a follow-up from fans or executives. However, it did prove there was strength in the brand, and that eventually turned into the rebooted TV series. The Slayer hunts vampires. Buffy is a Slayer, don't tell anyone. Well, I think that's all the vampire information you need. Buffy's adventures on the small screen easily eclipsed the popularity of the film. As a matter of fact, it went as far as becoming a cultural touchstone of the 90s and early 2000s. Talk about rising from the dead. Do you ever wonder why nobody cool ever wants to hang out with you? <laughs> Just thankful. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.